Um, hello, guys. Uh, so this is going to be the second uh, session in the Network Fundamentals um, series of videos. Um, and, and this one today is specifically around uh, that L4 or layer 4 that we were looking at in, um, in the OSI model. And that's all around, um, you know, the the way that we uh, manage the communication between an application and the network, and then how we um, break down that data stream into then chunks of data. And the two main protocols that we use for that are TCP and UDP. There, there are plenty other uh, protocols at the L4 layer, but TCP and UDP are, are two of the most well-known use cases and, and protocols. So uh, it kind of makes sense to focus on them and then uh, some of that knowledge can be taken across into those other protocols. Obviously, every protocol at L4 um, has their own unique spins on things and, and does things differently, but I think understanding TCP and UDP and how they work, uh, or at least to a high level, helps to understand how, um, how that L4 portion of the network stack really does operate. So, from a really high standard, high, high, high level, what is TCP? What is UDP? Well, uh, they are data flow protocols. So as I mentioned before, um, you have uh, that level four. If I actually bring up this diagram here, reminds you back to that OSI model that we were talking about previously. And if you haven't seen that video and you, and you don't know what OSI is or the OSI model is, best to go back and just uh, refresh your knowledge there and then probably uh, start watching this video. But in essence, we're sending data from an application down a network stack. And, and today we're talking about TCP, which lay uh, which sits at the layer four le level. And we're communicating between the OS or the, the application and the network portions. Um, so layers three, two, and one. And so it's all really focused around um, the flow of data from the application onto the network. So the use of TCP is, is relatively reliable. So what we usually know about TCP is that it's reliable and it will it'll make sure that you can receive the, the traffic um, and it will acknowledge things. Whereas UDP is effectively best effort. It's going to send it on the, on the wire down the network uh, without any real uh, appreciation or care for the end device or any congestion. So TCP is very reliable. Uh, it's connection orientated. So it makes sure that there is actually a path between that source and destination before it tries to, oh, sorry, before it tries to forward it down the network stack, um, the, the actual data that is. Um, because there's no point sending the data across the network if you can't actually get to the end device. So that's what TCP does. It makes sure that there is an actual connection before it tries to send any data whatsoever. It also is reliable in a sense that it will um, have acknowledgements to the data that is sent. So if you send 500 bytes of traffic from a source to a destination, well, TCP is going to make sure that that 500 bytes is actually um, acknowledged and that the source knows that the destination has actually received that 5,000 bytes. TCP also ensures that the packets that are sent, you know, in, in order one, two, three, and four, are actually passed back up to the application and are, are received, well, not necessarily received, but passed up to the application in the correct order they were sent. So if you send the packet one, two, three, four, in that order, the application gets that data in that order, one, two, three, four. Obviously, we're talking about hundreds, thousands, millions of packets, but uh, at, that, at that high level, you're making sure that things are ordered correctly. And so that, that's really important. If you take the example of, let's say, SSH, what you want is uh, for your characters to come through at the right rate, at the right time, but also for them to be in line uh, in, in the right order. So if you're on an SSH terminal and you get a garbled string because maybe some characters are in front of others, well, then it hasn't been reordered correctly. Those packets that are coming through from the SSH session, they haven't been reordered. And, and that would happen if we were to use something like UDP. Uh, whereas TCP will try and reorder those packets and make sure that they are in the correct sequence. So that when you're using your SSH terminal, for example, it actually makes sense and you can read the prompt. Otherwise, it's just going to be garbage. 
so talking about UDP, I'm not calling it garbage to be clear, um, but it's more for non-critical communication or applications where real time is more important than uh, reliability. Uh, so that might be a media application. So you take the likes of uh, streaming uh, video from a source to a destination. Um, and that's more focused, let's say, on actual real time, low latency applications. Maybe you want to use UDP rather than TCP, because if you're using TCP and you lost one of those frames, one of those packets, well, your stream at the receiving end, where it's trying to decode that and process it, it's going to stop. It's going to wait for that, uh, that lost packet to be resent and then ordered correctly before then it continues to go on to actually uh, present that to the user. Whereas in the case of UDP, we can ensure that um, we process the packets as they come, which might mean that we get some kind of slightly out of order packets, but overall the, the, uh, the experience of that stream will probably be a little bit better than if it was with TCP. You know, if you take the example of a phone call, um, if you are using TCP to transmit a voice message across a, a phone line, well, then you could end up with big pauses in your in what you're listening to the other person on the, uh, the uh, other end of the line. Whereas if you're using something along the lines of UDP, well, you might just lose one tiny little bit of their their audio. Now, obviously, in the case of phone lines, that's that's acceptable. You can you can probably in your mind piece together what they've said if you've missed out one character. But obviously, if it's then completely reordered, that's not good. Um, you know, or if we wait for a second and then suddenly we get a, a bunch of audio come, in, come through with the case of TCP, that's not good either. Uh, so it really does depend on the use case that you're using that, that you have as to whether you choose UDP or TCP. It's not as simple as I need reliability, so let's use T TCP. Because you've also got to remember, there are many cases where you can, um, at the application layer, add on reliability. So consider I'm, I'm presenting this to a you know, media-focused audience. You can take that example and apply it to something along the lines of SRT. SRT, for those who don't know, is a, um, how do I describe it? It is a, um, a protocol which can send media traffic over a network, over an IP network. And what it's doing is it's using UDP at the L4, but L5 and above at the application layer, it is actually making sure that those packets are getting there. It's enabling um, that reliable communication and ensuring that as best as it can with inside a, a buffer period that all the packets are getting there reordered before then they're getting sent out to a decoder to make sure that that image is then or audio is presented on a screen somewhere so that's just one example of how you could use udp and you could take the benefits of udp so real-time applications real-time sending of traffic but add on that level of reliability that you see in TCP. And you can effectively merge the two together without having all the drawbacks of just TCP or just UDP. Now, it's important also to note that um, at this layer, layer four, we're dealing with fragmentation of the data as well from the, from the application. So the application will just send data as a stream effectively. And we've got to, uh, L4 be able to fragment that into the right sizes. Um, in the case of UDP, most likely it's going to take that data that's come in and it's going to straight away immediately forward it on and uh, send it down the stack. In the case of TCP, it may start to try and window it and it might start to try and uh, group bits of data together to make sure that it has a, uh, a full segment or a full packet or a full chunk of data to be then sent down the network. And we'll talk a little bit more of that um, in a little bit later down on the uh, on the slides. But it's also important to note at L4, we're also dealing with the ports, the communication between that application and the network. So it's important to remember that we have those source and destination ports. 
And what happens is when we when we set up com a connection, we're we're mapping a specific port and a specific interface back to a specific application. So we're mapping all of those together. And, and I say application, but really we should be thinking in the sense of uh, a process because uh, there'll be many processes that make up one specific application. One of those processes might be to listen for traffic. So that's a really high level view of TCP and UDP. And just to reiterate that UDP, as I mentioned, it's connectionless. So your, your data flow might look something along these lines. You're sending a request. B is then responding straight away. Uh, a is sending another request. And then B is responding straight away. There's there's no sense of acknowledgement or session establishment. It just sends the traffic best effort. And if B responds, happy days. If it doesn't, well then the higher level application should have to manage that re-response, that re-request. Um, otherwise, your application isn't going to have all the relevant data. Now, maybe in that specific application, that is perfectly fine. Now, obviously, as I mentioned, there's many different use cases for UDP, mainly focused around things like real time applications. So you've got VoIP, media streams, or even real time machine control messages in a factory, for example. All are potential good, valid use cases of UDP. And as I mentioned before with that SRT example, your application could add that level of reliability that TCP provides while still using that underlay, underlying layer of UDP at L4. Obviously, though, that comes with some additional potential resource utilization at the application layer. You know, So instead of using uh, the, the built-in functionality of TCP, you're then having to build that into a application, which might not be as efficient, right? But at the same time, it's then going to be more specific for your use case. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, I'm talking very generically here. Um, while I mentioned SRT, it's to give a bit of an example. Um, it's not to say this is exactly what's happening. Um, so bear that in mind. Now we then have TCP. Uh, yet again, quick review. It's connection orientated. So we're going to set up a session. Uh, so we're going to use what's called a SYN flag, um, and then we're going to acknowledge that initial SYN. That SYN, that SYN is there to uh, trigger setting up a session between source and destination. Once we've set up that session, that bi-directional session, we can then start sending traffic or the data. So A sends some data, and then B receives it and it acknowledges it, and that's the whole concept of TCP. It's it's setting up that connection and then any data that is sent, it's acknowledged. And we'll dig into that a little bit more in the next slides. Um, and that's where it's going to get a little bit more technical in this specific uh, session. Now, TCP then also has some other things that I haven't mentioned yet. Um, it is, um, how do I say this? It is highly um, configurable to a certain degree. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, control that you can add in to TCP or you can make take advantage of. Um, so you've got advanced congestion avoidance algorithms. You've got um, flow control. So you can ensure that you only send certain amounts of traffic at certain rates. You know, if you start to lose packets, so if you see congestion potentially, you can then algorithmically control that sending rate you know, so you can be, you know, ramping up your speed, but then you hit some kind of congestion. You start dropping traffic, traffic, and then you drop that speed down to a to a lower layer, till then you rise back up and you start finding a more suitable uh, bandwidth or sending rate. Um, as I mentioned, though, those congestion avoidance algorithms are very technical, and I'm not going to touch on them today more than what I've already mentioned. Um, they are they they can very quickly become very technical and very theoretical uh, with a lot of you know uh, maths and algebra to to get involved with basically so a little bit about out of scope of this series, uh, series however it's nice to know that there is these kind of congestion avoidance uh, mechanisms built into tcp to make sure that 
uh, we don't go and just completely flood the network. Because you've got to remember back with UDP, what UDP is going to do is it's just going to forward traffic. It's not going to think, oh, do I have enough bandwidth between point A and point B? Can B even handle all of this traffic at once? Maybe not. Maybe B is some kind of um, really old receiving device. And if you send it too much traffic, it's just going to freak out, panic, and then crash. Um, so this is why we use things like TCP to con actually control how much data is actually being sent. Maybe B only can accept 1,000 bytes. And if you send it more than 1,000, as I said, maybe it's going to crash. Maybe it can't handle it. As a result, maybe it's going to drop packets, and, and that's going to be inefficient uh, over the network because then you're going to have to retransmit. And those retransmits might get lost and so on and so forth. It's it's a it's a domino effect effectively. Um, so that's why we have those con congestion avoidance um, algorithms, and that's why we have this this level of control uh, to make sure that it is reliable as possible. Most uh, yeah, as reliable as possible. Um, so TCP famously used for things like web traffic, FTP, and SSH. Um, if you think about the types of traffic that you're sending and, and the use cases uh, and what you're trying to achieve with those uh, applications, TCP fits perfectly. You know, you want traffic to actually get there. You want all the data for that web uh, website to actually get to the user to make sure that your web page is displayed correctly. You know, FTP is another example because you, know, you want to transfer, you know, um, an operating system image from point A to point B using FTP, probably not the best example. Uh, but you know, if you lose a portion of that um, transfer, well then you might end up with a corrupted uh, operating system image, which might then go and end up breaking a host. So TCP is really important in the, those kind of situations to make sure that the actual data that you've sent actually gets there and nothing is missed. And as I mentioned, there's a wide range of control flags actually under the hood on those headers for TCP that actually controls the way that some of these things uh, operate. Um, I will get into a few of them in the next slides, um, and I'll try and get a little bit more technical with it. Um, but at the same time, I'm trying to make sure that it is understandable. So obviously, in the next slides, I'm going to go over sessions, how we actually establish those sessions. And then I'm also going to go through the data flow. So how we actually send those traffics, how how that windowing works, uh, how that rate limiting works. Um, they're going to be relatively technical, but hopefully I should be able to explain it in such a way that kind of makes sense. If something doesn't make sense, though, let me know and I can try and explain it later. So TCP sessions, as I mentioned, TCP requires us to um, to have a connection established before we send any data, um, and and this this takes a little bit of a process to actually enable. So let's take the example that um, B is some kind of web server, um, and A wants to look up and see a website, uh, a web page of some form. So what B is going to do as it runs some kind of server application, some web server application. That application in itself is going to say, OK, I need to start listening to uh, port 80, for example, for any requests for a specific website that I'm hosting. So TCP, uh, so the application, sorry, is going to then talk down the stack towards TCP and it's going to say, hey, I need to open a socket between this process or this application and this specific local uh, port and interface. And so what TCP does, um, is it will open that socket, it will store the details of the connection, and it will start listening for traffic on that port, on that IP, and then forward any traffic up towards that specific application that's requested it. Now on the, on the client side, it does relatively the same thing. It says, okay, I want to get this website. I know it's behind this specific IP, and I know to get to websites, I need to use port 80 by default. So I'm going to send my uh, request down the stack towards TCP to actually try and connect to that host B. When we do that, TCP receives that request and it, yet again, forms some kind of socket, it, that, that connection between your client application, your web browser, and that local port that you're initiating on your host. 
Now, in the case of web traffic, that's going to be something random because you are the client trying to trying to match up to um, a port 80 on a well-known port on a on a server. So host A is going to initiate that connection. It is going to initiate that socket as well to make sure that it listens for any traffic coming back from the destination, from the server. And to set up this session, we now then start sending messages. We need to start sending what's called a SYN, uh, uh, initially a TCP message with a SYN flag set. And what that SYN flag on the TCP header is going to do is it's going to say, hey, I want to set up a connection between myself, my sending device, the source, and this destination, this given destination. So TCP initiates that. It sends the, the normal TCP message with no data, um, but with that SYN flag set. And there's a bunch of other details in the background as well for the connection, some options and some uh, some relevant settings, uh, but they're, they're a little bit of out of scope right now. So let's focus just on that SYN flag. B, Device B or the destination or the server, whatever you want to say, receives that TCP message um, and re processes it and sees that the SYN flag is set. As a result, B now knows that it needs to actually set up that connection. It needs to process it and it needs to say, OK, is this good or is this bad? Uh, can I set up a connection for this specific thing? As part of that, if I understand correctly, it's going to check its list of sockets and it's going to say, yes, OK, that matches that. I can do this. Happy days. As a result, without any extra steps, what it would do at this stage is it needs to acknowledge that that session can be set up. So at the next step, what it's going to do is it's going to send out another TCP message to actually acknowledge that that session can be set up. So the next thing that the server does is it will process and it will try and generate this TCP message with an acknowledgement to that initial synchronization message. At the same time, because we need that bi-directional communication between the source and the destination, the server, the destination, will set up or try and set up a return um, path or se uh, session between the two devices. So that allows uh, the server or the destination to respond and acknowledge the, uh, the request that the client has uh, requested and also then um, send back the in this case the web the website that the client has requested so to do that the server sends back a sin message at the same time that it is sending that acknowledgement message um, obviously this only applies if it can do this if it, if it feels like it can't set up that return message then obviously it's not going to do it but in a perfect world uh, in, in probably 99 percent of cases, it will actually send back this SYN message to set up a connection in the reverse direction. And so the client receives a another TCP message and it and it processes that and it sees, OK, the SYN flag is set and the ACK flag is set. What it knows from that is because it sees the acknowledgement, it knows, OK, happy days, my initial uh, SYN message or synchronization or request to set up a connection has been acknowledged. Happy days. B is now happy to receive my traffic. It also sees the SYN message. So it also acknowledges that and, and says, OK, that means that B wants to set up a connection to me. So I need to process that. I need to double check that everything's good for that and that I can accommodate that. Once A has, or well, the client has uh, processed that and it's happy, it itself sends back a TCP message with the ACK field set or the ACK bit set. And once B receives that or the server, the destination receives that, it can then acknowledge, it, it can then understand and process that TCP message and see because it's got that ACK message to its, its own SYN message that it sent previously, it knows that that synchronization has been done and we have set up that connection from B towards A. And as a result, at this point, there is a bi, uh, bi-directional connection between the client and the server. And those two can now start talking between them uh, and sending data uh, bi-directionally. So that explains the sessions and how we actually set up those sessions and uh, manage them. Now, there are a few other um, 
header control flags, there's things like uh, reset, there's things like urgent and there's push. I won't go into them today because they are a little bit more complex and a little bit out of scope for what we really need to uh, know to understand TCP, uh, but just know that they exist. Now there is another flag that I didn't mention then and that is the fin flag. And so the fin flag is very much similar to the sin flag. However, it's used when uh, either device identifies that it wants to shut down a session or close a session. Um, and it, it's used in very much the similar way as the SYN messages. So where you see SYN on this diagram, you can replace it with FIN. And that explains to you how we can uh, tear down a session. So a client sends a FIN message. The server receives that and says, OK, Happy days, it wants to tear down the session. Okay, I'll process that, acknowledge it. Yeah, that's all good. Send back an acknowledgement message. And now I want to close my session as well back to uh, the client. I'm going to send a fin message. Client acknowledges that. It also sees its acknowledgement uh, for the uh, fin that was sent out to the server and it shuts it all down. It acknowledges then that it's happy to close the final session. And at that point, everything is terminated. So that's how then you tear down that session. It's very similar to how you set it up. Um, so hopefully that explains the sessions and hopefully I haven't lost anyone along the way. Um, now this is called, if you haven't already heard, uh, realized this is the three-way handshake that a lot of people talk about with TCP. Because we are going in, we're, we, we're using three ways. We're, we're setting up the connection, we're acknowledging that setup and also at the same time requesting to set up another session. And then we're finally acknowledging that reverse uh, connection. So that is sessions. But now we've set up a session. Well, now we need to send traffic. And that's where the data flow portion of TCP comes into play. Uh, how am I doing with time? That's all good. So that's where the TCP data flow comes into play. At this point, we are trying to send traffic. And um, as I mentioned before, before this is relatively technical, but at the same time, I've, I've hopefully came up with this diagram that tries to make a little bit more sense of it. Um, I'm going to reiterate again, this is an example. Um, it's not something that represents full real life, real truth and theory. Um, but it should be accurate enough that um, the concept is conveyed uh, and such that you can, you know, if you actually see the real world headers and traffic, you can kind of start to appreciate roughly what I'm on about. So in this example, we have host A, host B, source, destination, and we've already set, well, we're going to set up the session. And I'm going to kind of slightly ignore that that session portion um, and kind of gloss over it to a certain degree. But A wants to send 10,000 bytes of data, whatever data, doesn't matter, to device B uh, or, or the destination. Now, conveniently, um, the maximum segment size that we can use over the medium between A and B is 1,000. And I think I mentioned on this uh, earlier about segment size. So segment size is uh, it's taking that application data that we've received from the application and it's taking that and uh, segmenting it into chunks of data that we can comfortably send across the, uh, the network medium that we have. So this is derived based on, uh, you know, both what we can send as one single segment between point A and point B, and then minusing off any, any size that we need to reserve for any of these headers. So this L2 or L3 header that we need to subsequently uh, add on to the packet that we send. Because we can only, in some certain technologies, we can only send a certain size of a uh, chunk of data before it's a little bit too long for a device to process. Uh, depending on the, the protocol that you use L2, that depends on the, those, those sizes. So coming back to this data flow, hopefully that makes sense in the segment size. So that segment size could be anything, but the maximum segment size is really important because you can't go beyond that because then you start you start losing the space that you have allocated to those specific headers. And if you can't add the headers, well, then you can't process it downstream. You can't actually forward the traffic to the end destination. 
So that's why we have that maximum segment size to make sure that we're not sending too much at one point. So in this case, as I mentioned, we have 1000 bytes. The maximum segment size, the, the maximum amount of data that we can send at one time is 1000. So conveniently, obviously, um, that allows us 10 segments. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Ten. I've represented ten as zero. Hopefully, you get the idea. Um, and so we have a bit of a color coding system for this. Um, I'll walk you through what that means as we go. Um, so to start off with, A starts to set up the session with B with that sin flag that we talked about previously. Now, in that initial sin, there is a flag or field called a sequence number. Now that sequence number is used to actually stamp those uh, segments that we send with some kind of ID to make sure that we can uniquely identify them. And that is the important bit in uh, understanding this reliable communication between uh, source and destination. Without that sequence number, we can't acknowledge properly. We don't know what we're acknowledging. Uh, so we set up a sequence number and that sequence number nowadays is based on a random generator, a random number generator. It used to be based on the clock, uh, but that was very easily um, attacked. And um, yeah, you, you can you can do attacks based on that, based on understanding the clock and understanding the sequence number that a device generated. So nowadays it's based on some kind of random number generator and algorithm behind that. And so in some cases you might see 99, but usually that'll be a large number that is randomly generated. Now I've used 999 uh, to make this very easy and to understand it. So it's not messy maths basically. So we send that SYN message with a sequence number of 999. B receives that SYN and it says, yep, yeah, okay, all good with that connection request. I'm gonna send back an acknowledgement. Now with inside that acknowledgement, it's acknowledging the sequence number that we have just sent or the amount of bytes that we have already sent uh, per se. Now in this situation, in the very unique situation where we are uh, acknowledging for the uh, session establishment, what B does is it will iterate the sequence number by one and um, acknowledge based on that. And one way to think of this acknowledgement number that is sent back from destination to source is it's saying, I've acknowledged your data. I'm now expecting the sequence number 1000 in this case, in this very specific case. So this acknowledgement number can help to understand how much data has been sent or how much data has been acknowledged. Now that's based in bits, sorry, bytes. And I believe there's some way that you can make it to acknowledge based on uh, octets rather than bytes, which is a multiple of bytes. I think it's eight bytes make up an octet. Don't quote me uh, yet again. Um, but there is, I believe, some way that we can change that. So then it's uh, a smaller number represents a larger uh, volume of data. Obviously, in these days where we're potentially sending gigabytes uh, worth of traffic in, in a period, that's more um, needed nowadays. So there is also another uh, field that we send back with this acknowledgement uh, that you guys might have noticed here, and that's the window. Now the concept of the window is uh, enables us to have that uh, control of data flow. And so the window says, uh, when sending back from the destination to the source, it's saying I can accept 4,000 bytes of data without having any issues. Um, and that might be based on a, on a range of different things. That might be based on uh, the load of the system at the time. It might be based on a, um, a memory allocation or a buffer size on a, on a network interface. Um, there's a range of different things that can influence that. But the best way to just imagine it right now is basically saying B or the destination can hold 4,000 packets, or th sorry, 4,000 bytes. Um, that can then be processed. And once they're processed, that window can then start to be released and you can start sending more data again. So what happens when we receive this acknowledgement on the, on the uh, source is that that source will see, it will process that uh, uh, TCP message and it will see that the ACK field is set. So it says, yes, great news, uh, my session is established. It's also gonna then see the acknowledgement number and it's gonna say, okay, Great, I 
uh, B is now ex expecting uh, the data that starts with the sequence number 1000. And it's also seeing that window field of 4000. So it itself stores that locally and it says, OK, B can receive 4000. Great. Now, the way that I've represented this is that equals four segments. That's to make it easy to understand right now, but it's important to also realize that that window size isn't limited to, you know, four segments in this size, or it isn't limited to the uh, based on the maximum segment size. What that is, is it's a it's a window of saying just purely I can receive 4000 uh, bytes. Whether that is in 4,000 one byte messages or whether that is one 4,000 byte message, doesn't matter. But what matters is it can receive 4,000 bytes. Um, so A acknowledges that effectively and it, it understands that and processes it, installs it, and then references it going forward. So the next step that A is going to do, it's going to send a portion of data. Now, if you recall back to me mentioning about the uh, congestion avoidance algorithms, what they do is they make sure that you slowly ramp up as you uh, send data. So to start off with, A isn't just going to blast the network and send those 4,000 bytes that it knows B can receive. It's going to start off with 2,000 in this situation. It might not start off with 2,000. It might start off with something else. But in this example, I'm, I'm emulating that it's not it's not full blast right now. It's, it's starting off small and then it's going to work its way up. So to start off with, it sends its first message, which is one uh, segment. And we know that the maximum segment size is 1000. So it's going to send 1000 bytes. And B knows that because it has uh, with inside TCP, it has a specific field for length. Obviously, it can understand that from actually processing the data, um, but that is something to note that there will be a field that has length defined there. Uh, so that can make these kind of calculations a little bit easier. It also then has the sequence number. Uh, and this is, as I mentioned before, that it is that, that unique um, identifier for this specific packet to say this packet has the reference of 1000, we can imagine. Um, now that then uh, starts to influence uh, how we acknowledge back. So based on the length and the sequence number, we can then acknowledge and say, okay, we're now expecting this. Anyway, A is sending two, right? So we need to send the next uh, message. So we send another 2000 bytes. Now, because the sequence number is based on the amount of bytes that have been sent, it increments the sequence number by 1000. That's because we've already sent 1000 bytes. Now, in this situation of this second packet, it gets lost somewhere in the network. It doesn't get to B or B drops it for some reason or somewhere along the network. There was some kind of impact that stopped that from getting to B. So in this scenario, B has, has only received that first segment. So what it's going to do is it's going to process that. It's going to understand it and it's going to pass it up to the application that's relevant for it. And it's going to send back an acknowledgement. But in this situation, it's going to only ac acknowledge the 1000 bytes that we've just sent. So it knows the message that it's just received has a sequence number of 1000. So it increments that 1000 by the length of the data that it's just received, 1000. And it sends back an acknowledgement of 2000 to say, hey, I'm now expecting the uh, the segment or the packet starting with 2000 or the sequence number 2000. As you've also noticed, it's remained the window size at 4000. So because we've acknowledged and processed one segment one, we can now send all the way up to uh, segment five. So we've now got four 4000 bytes or four segments that can be received on B. Very similar to how we started off. So OK. A has, uh, has, has seen that, he's seen that acknowledgement and it marks that first segment as sent and acknowledged and it forgets about it effectively. However, it still sees that two has been sent but not acknowledged. So it keeps, effectively, it keeps a copy of it. So it's ready to be resent if it needs to be. At this point, A is just thinking, well, maybe B is a little bit slow and it hasn't fully acknowledged. 
So it continues to use up that available window. And because it's now 4,000, it can now send all the way up to segment five. So it's now starting to think, OK, things are going well. I've got an acknowledgement. I've not got any congestion yet because it doesn't know that this this uh, this second message didn't get there. So it starts sending now three segments. So it's going to send the first of those three. That's 1000 long. And because the last sequence number that we sent was 2000 and that was length 1000, we're going to iterate that sequence number by 1000 to make 2000. So that's going to be added to the TCP header there, the sequence number of 3000. Because we're sending another 1000 bytes, we're going to iterate it again. So that's 4000 and then another 1000 to make 5000. At this point, A has used up all the available TCP window, so it can't send any more data. Realistically, at this point, it needs to wait for some kind of acknowledgement or some kind of signal to say, yes, you can send more. So an increased window size potentially. Now on the B side, on the receiving device, because it hasn't received that second segment, it can't start to process three, four and five, or it can't acknowledge them because they were still waiting for this seg second segment to uh, arrive. As I should have mentioned earlier, and I think I did, uh, TCP is, is also responsible for reordering these segments. So if it can't fully reorder them based on that sequence number, then it can't acknowledge it. it. It doesn't know where it sits in the whole stream of data. So it needs to wait until it's got a contiguous stream of uh, segments that actually form a block of data. Um, if you have a missing segment, well, then it needs to wait for that missing segment. So what it does, uh, what B does, because it saw these messages come in, but however, it's still missing segment two, it sends back an acknowledgement only for this segment one and saying, hey, acknowledgement 2000. So I'm expecting to see the next bit of data with the sequence number of 2000. Remember, B lost that bit of data up here. So B hasn't received it whatsoever, so it can't process it at all. So B sat there thinking, well, I, I still need segment two, so I need to signal that back to A. So that's what that's exactly what it's doing here. And because it hasn't processed um, three, four or five, it isn't increasing its window at all. So A cannot send because it's already used up all of the available window by sending two, three, four, uh, and five, that 4,000 bytes. So A still has no opportunity to send any more data, but because A is now getting back a, a second acknowledgement that has that same sequence number of 2,000, A can now recognize that, hey, okay, B didn't get that message starting with sequence number 2,000. So I'm gonna resend that, and that's what's happening here. Now we can imagine that the network worked perfectly, flawlessly. Obviously, that never happens. Um, and it actually got there. Uh, so now B actually has received all of those four segments that it was waiting for, three of which it already had, right? And now that forms that contiguous block of data, and it's all reordered nicely. There's no missing data in between. So it can acknowledge it all. So at this point, B is going to process two, three, four, and five. And as a result, everything's good, and it acknowledges that. Now it's acknowledging it based on that, uh, that sequence number iterated, uh, based on the last amount of data that we sent. So as a result, it's acknowledging 6,000. That's what it's expecting next as the next sequence number. However, at this point, some of you might have noticed the window size is zero. Now what that means is B doesn't have any more space to receive any more data. Maybe it's buffers full. Uh, maybe the network interface is having issues and it's highly utilized. Maybe the resources on the device are uh, too contended for it to receive any more data. So it's signaling back to A saying, hey, hold off sending any more. I can't accept any, my plate's full. I, I, I can't, I simply cannot accept any more, you know, because if it does get sent, well, then it's probably just gonna drop it. And that's gonna be wasted bandwidth for the network between A and B, which isn't what we want. 
Now some time passes um, and B starts to release some of those resources and it starts to be able to increase its window again. And as a result, B is going to send back an acknowledgement saying, OK, now my window is 4000. Still acknowledgement 6000 because I'm expecting the next sequence number to be 6000. Device A receives that and it sees, OK, happy days. The window is now back at 4000. I can now send six, seven, eight and nine. And so on and so forth. At this point, it would then start sending again. It would start by sending uh, some traffic based on the first sequence number being 6000. Then it'd be seven, eight, nine and so on and so forth. And at this point, things continue, things start recurring. But this is the underlying process of how this data flow works. So you start sending, you potentially see some congestion, you wait off until you get it resent. Um, and then you potentially acknowledge in a block to say, yes, I've received all of these segments. Maybe then the window size starts to reduce. So then you slow down on your transmission um, and maybe then it starts to increase. So then you can speed up your transmission. So that's how TCP can control that data flow. Without all of this, it's then just UDP. It doesn't do any kind of acknowledgement. So you might get lost packets. You know, if this was UDP and we were transmitting data, A would never know unless the application told it that B had actually lost that second segment. And B would only have a portion of the actual application data that was initially sent. So that might cause some kind of corruption or some issues with the application. So that's why these messages and these control information are so important. Um, without them, TCP just doesn't work. So that's everything for what I was going to cover today. Um, hopefully that starts to explain how TCP works. And, and if you ever see it in the wild and see some of those behaviors where it's you know, picking up and slowing down and picking up and slowing down, maybe now you can start to understand why that might actually be happening um, or what might be causing that. Uh, so hopefully you found that interesting and obviously if there's any questions, please feel free to let me know and I'll try and help you out. Thanks for watching.